Splendens is probably the best known Gadiad in the hobby. First seen in the early 1980s, it would appear in pet shops as something new and different, but was only seen occasionally. With the disappearance of many species that you don't that you don't see anymore, uh, that were novel or possibly different, uh, maybe difficult to produce commercially, the Splendens is rarely seen in pet shops today, but it's still kept fairly commonly in the specialty hobby. A particularly pretty Gadiad, their appearance suffers with poor care, and when given quality water conditions and occasional live food. It becomes obvious why this fish is commonly known as the butterfly gudea. Even as a gudea, the splendens can handle warmer temperatures and can be kept long term at 77 to 78 degrees without much apparent harm. However, they're most comfortable under 75. The other great things about them is that, that unlike many live bearers and certainly unlike many gudeas, the splendens are very good about not eating or frying. The females, however, do not like being confined to a net breeder when gravid and will often drop their spawn early when moved into one. As a result, if a couple pair are put into a 30 gallon tank with some fine leaf plants and taken well care of, the tank will reach its capacity in about 18 months. The young are healthy and robust when they're born and will feed on baby brine shrimp and crush dry food immediately. Females will drop 5 to 15 young after a 60 day gestation and here they breed seasonally but in a fish room without light cues, they should breed year-round for you. The only issue with the Splendens is that, though they're not especially aggressive with one another, males will chase one another, and, but there's never any damage done. They have been known to harass other tank mates, and you will want to watch them at first to see how they get along with the others in the tank. They may be fine, but this isn't a fish I'd put with others that have long flowing fins or that are particularly slow moving. Brought into the hobby to build up its numbers, this fish was thought to be possibly extinct in the wild within just the last 10 years. However, there's two, there were two small populations found uh, not too long ago, and there's hope that this fish may recover in the wild, but right now they are considered critically endangered. Okay, for our next question, Matthew writes, Hi, Mr. Sage. My name is Matthew, and I'm 15, and I have two 10-gallon tanks and one 20-gallon tank, and I want to breed hatchet fish, but there's not much online. Have you ever bred hatchet fish? Bris uh, Matthew asks, Brisbane, Australia. Um, well, Matthew, I, I, I had never bred hatchet fish, um, and in fact, as you know, I went ahead and looked through some of the books here and tried to find out what I could, and there really aren't uh, bred in captivity very frequently, so there wasn't much much on breeding them, and they're not a fish that uh, uh, usually you can breed in captivity. But you bring up a great point, and this is something I wanted to address. Let's say I'm a, I'm a fish farmer or a breeder, or uh, I come up with a new fish. For instance, uh, the green dragons I have here. I've had a number of fish farms approach me, and they want me to breed them up and sell them to them. Um, and I've turned them down because the, 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 the fish is still so much in development. I'm still breeding for better finish, for better color, et cetera, et cetera. But eventually I'll get to the point where I've got a fish that's just like this spectacularly consistent fish. So <clears throat> then I would breed up a number of them and I'd be able to get contracts to ship them off to, to uh, uh, farms or to wholesalers or distributors that would then uh, send them out to your pet stores. When you go to a pet store and buy a fish, when it's in the gazillion, when it's been bred by the gazillions, and uh, you bring it home, it's not necessarily going to be the best representation of that species of that fish. And so, though it might not look like much, and but you like the species and you want to, uh, uh, you 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 would love to see more of it or, or get a better version of it. Um, most of the species, many of the species in pet stores available today you can breed yourself. And when you breed them, let's say you get a pair from the pet store. So a pet store gets in their shipment. Let's say you like blue rams. So you go to this pet store when the blue rams come in, they get in and you look at their order when it first comes in and you've got maybe say 30 fish or 50 fish to choose from. You pick the, the best six or seven, take them home. 
get pairing off going on, breed them up in numbers, pick the very best out of that spawn, uh, breed them up, then you get to uh, breed the next group uh, into the second generation, and now you're going to get some really spectacular looking fish. The, set, the first generation is going to be much better than the fish you got from the pet store, but the second generation will, be, will start to get the line to where it was when the breeders originally introduced it to the wholesalers. So many of the fish in the, in the, that we can buy, as I mentioned, that is, all, any of the anabantids, garamis, are all not that difficult to breed. Um, all of your barbs, the danios, resboras, can be bred in the same way that the Odessa barb breeding is described in the three Odessa breeding videos that I have out. So uh, they can all be bred. Uh, the Cories can be bred pretty easily. The, a lot of the Plecos now we're getting in the pet stores can be bred. So like, that's kind of where it gets fun is when you start taking a line and then improving it and building it up and building upon it. Then you get numbers, you can sell them back to the pet shops. The fish you have will be of better quality than, the, than, than they're getting from, from the overseas because you have the luxury to sec selectively breed them and give only your best fish out to the stores. So uh, I have a friend right now here in Colorado that's doing exactly that with the Blue Rams. So uh, there's a lot to be gained, a lot more fun to be had, a lot more to be learned. Um, and the whole point is, is that you get to figure out the fish, you get to understand how it works, you get to understand how it breeds, you raise the young up, um, and then you can make some money at it at the same time. So if you see a fish at the pet store that you really like, like, uh, you know, you see a tank of something that comes in and you think, oh my goodness, you buy a couple of them, well, you can enjoy that fish for years simply by going ahead and making an effort to breed it. So there's a lot of available information available on doing that. If you do decide you want to try to breed something, you can write me and, and, and others that will tell you how to get set up and how to go about it and maybe what references to check to help you with parameters and that sort of thing. So anyway, um, uh, the, give it a try. Talk to you soon. For the next question, Barb writes, Hi Greg, thank you so much for all that you do for the hobby and I've kept sword tails for many years. I would like to order six of yours if offer as my eye, but you have a lot of good deeds at your site and I've never heard of them before. Are they different from regular live bears? Someone told me they reproduce very differently, but you can still breed them in the aquarium. Do you know why you never see them in pet shops? Great questions. Um, for that, we got to go to some video. I first discovered Goodeads around 1996, eventually bringing them home from American Live Bear Association conventions. The only Goodead I'd ever seen was the Amica Splendens. I didn't know much about it and found they were colorful, attractive, hardy, prolific, and easy to raise. There's over 40 species in the genus, and many are still available in the hobby. Of those 40 plus species, all but four are either extinct entirely, extinct in the wild, threatened, or endangered. Gadeids are the only truly viviparous fish in that they reproduce much more like we do than other live bears. They have internal fertilization, as, as all live bears do, but instead of the female simply providing safety for the developing eggs within her, uh, with Gadeids, the young are actually nourished by the mother through the fish equivalent of an umbilical cord called a trophotania, and the young are born with this thing coming out of their stomachs that falls off after a few hours after birth. As a result, the gestation for the Gadeids is twice as long as for the sword tails and mollies. They're 30 days, and the Gadeids are 60 days, and there are far fewer young in each drop. Where some Hellerai sword tails have been known to drop up a 200 fry, most young Gadeid females will drop only 5 to 10 fry their first couple times, and the most you'll ever see is about 12 to 15. When the young are born, they're huge. There's a group of one-day-old, uh, this is a group of one-day-old Iliadon fursidons swimming around uh, next to a half-inch line of PVC. Not only can they eat baby brine shrimp when they're first born, they can actually be started right off on dried flake. Besides the gestation, they also do the whole fertilization thing differently. With live bearers, we used to <clears throat> we're used to seeing a male with a gonopodium, such as with these Brachyraphis rosenii, Zephophorus helleri, and Alfaro coltratus. The Gadeids don't have this, and with them, as with this with this Crocodon audax, they possess what's called an andropodium, a simple notch at the end of their anal fin, the front the front half of their anal fin. And it always isn't easy to see and is more obvious in some species than others. As to how they do it, you got me. And supposedly, the male curls those first couple rays around to form a tube, and the sperm packet is then injected. But unlike the Pasiliids, the females do not hold on to the sperm to have multiple broods, so the female needs to be refertilized with each spawn. 
Don't know how they do it, but they do do it. And they're pretty successful at it. As to uh, uh, generally needing to be maintained in the low 70s, a few species can tolerate temperatures as high as 77 to 78 degrees. Some species, however, such as the crocodons, must not be kept higher than about 74 to 75, or they'll gradually die away on you. The other issue with the Gudeas is that though they can be great community fish, such as the Zooganeticus tequila or the Iliodon fursidens, others are best kept by themselves where they'll get along just fine with one another because they can sometimes be a little fin nippy. Species such as the Mika splendens, the Xenotoka doodroi, and the Xenotoka lion's eye. As to why they aren't in pet stores, well, the splendens has been in stores. But as a rule, they likely don't match with the type of care, breeding, and demand that larger farms prefer to work with, such as their preference for cooler temperatures or their level of productivity. So few have been seen in the commercial hobby. So hope that answers all the questions. Thank you for watching this latest video on the Amica Splendens and Keeping Good Ids. The next video is going to be on the Generation 2 Pleco Caves and also on breather bags. We're going to break up some breather bags and uh, compare the two different brands. Um, I look forward to seeing you then. Take care.